Hi there, welcome to The Real Agenda with me, Tom Burgess. Thanks for joining us and I hope you're keeping safe and well. Now The Real Agenda is about the answers to the fundamental problems of today that cause our unnecessary financial hardship and extreme economic inequality. Because that's The Real Agenda. Now today we're going to be talking tactics with Dr Gail Bradbrook, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, and about their new campaign, Extinction Rebellion, Money Rebellion. Now many people say they agree with the goals of Extinction Rebellion to get urgent action on climate change, but they don't always agree with the tactics. But history has shown us that non-violent civil disobedience gets results. Just look at the suffragettes and Gandhi. Now, XR is turning its attention to the economic systems where we only have to look at the financial hardship and the excessive wealth to see the significant inequality it produces. The system has failed us, but despite polls indicating that the majority of us want to see action, very little is actually happening. So XR plans money rebellion, and we'll have more from Gail on this in a moment. Now, I had the privilege of working with the late Reverend Paul Nicholson, on Taxpayers Against Poverty, a campaigning group that he founded. And the Reverend Paul understood the idea of non-violent civil disobedience in order to get intention and change. He refused to pay his council tax in protest of the fact that councils were taking people to court for non-payment. But they had no money and could hardly afford to eat. And indeed, his local councils have now stopped taking these those with council tax arrears to court. A few weeks before he died, aged 87, he did a sit-down protest outside Church House while the Church of England Synod was meeting to draw the attention to the plight of the homelessness and was due to do the same outside Downing Street two days before he died. Now the Reverend Paul had talked with Extinction Rebellion and as a result Gail contacted me about how we could cooperate so I thought it would be good if she could explain the background in this episode of the real agenda. Dr Gail Bradbrook's been researching, planning and training for mass civil disobedience since 2010 and it was in 2018 that she co-founded Extinction Rebellion which as we all know has grown rapidly internationally. There are now over 200 groups in the UK as well as 375 XR groups in 63 countries, that's all in two years. Gail has been arrested three times for acts of civil disobedience. Originally from Yorkshire, Gail studied molecular biophysics at the University of Manchester and is now the mother of two boys. So I think we can all agree that Extinction Rebellion, now known as XR, has been very effective in drawing attention to the need for urgent action on climate change. So I was keen to find out more about this next stage of Extinction Rebellion and how we can actually make this urgent change happen. I started by asking Gail to give us some background. We, we know that we're killing life on Earth, Tom, that we're in the sixth mass extinction event and credible commentators talk about the inevitable collapse of civilization. So it's not inevitable, but, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the situation we're looking at. Mass uh, food shortages, mass migration, problems with the water, with the soil, with pollution is apocalyptic. And it's an obvious question, like, why have we and why are we not doing anything about this? Why isn't there a plan? Why has the UK government set targets so far in advance and not got a credible plan and is actually doing things in the opposite direction to what's needed? Why have carbon emissions gone up by 60% since the first meeting of the IPCC, who are the science and uh, economics bodies that, that focus on on, on the climate change issue, why we're in an ecological crisis. And I think it's it's clear to many of us that there is resistance to change from a political economy which is creating the crisis, unable to face the crisis that is created and unable to adapt to it. The way I say it is we have to have a grown-up conversation about economics. And I, I, I quite prefer the phrase political economy because this is both about politics and economics and their absolute interwoven nature. 
there's a there's been a move for many years from sort of the quarters focusing on free market fundamentalism or neoliberalism, which would have us believe that economics, the system that we have, is a sort of emergent natural property like gravity is, and it's not. It's not an emergent natural property. It's it's a deliberate political choice that's being made, and that choice is is killing life on earth. So what you're saying is that the issue regarding the climate change, environmental damage, killing life on Earth, is that's causing that is actually the economic system that we have. That it's going to be sort of inevitable that these things with the current economic system, it's inevitable that these things will happen and it will eventually kill the planet. Is that what you're saying? Oh, obviously, it doesn't kill the planet, it, uh, but, but the uh, Permian mass extinction, which is one of the previous extinction events, killed the border. 95% of life on Earth, and there has been uh, one one paper suggesting we're emitting uh, carbon and, and damaging the environment in a in a similar way. I mean, this is all open to debate, but the point is, uh, we are in a mass extinction event. Uh, the the planet will carry on having some form of life, but it could be millions and millions of years before it recovers, and it's not clear that to what extent uh, human life on that planet is tenable. I, I guess. Reading the science and scientific commentary, people think that some human beings will live, but many billions will die, and it'll be a harsh and difficult existence. There's enough information to show us that we are badly going wrong here, and we have to change. Okay, so what are the main things regarding that you would want to change with the economic system? I, I think the other thing I want to say is that this economic system emerges from a deeper problem. Uh, that's been going on for for some time. Some people might want to use a word like patriarchy. I find the concept of Wetiko of a a kind of mind virus focused on domination and extraction and a separation from nature as being a sort of underlying principle that we have to move away from and and reclaim uh, different human culture and values. So uh, this is not a point about being you know, ideological and against the system and for that. I think we have to move beyond that kind of divisive conversation and talk about what's useful in the system that we have already that we can upcycle and what needs to change. And I think the first place that I would start a conversation with is what's the purpose of the economic system that we have? How is it measured? And, and, what, and what do we say when we believe it's been successful? But we know the key measure that people use, even though the inventor Simon Kuznick said, please don't use this as a key measure, is GDP, the amount of economic activity. It doesn't matter whether that economic activity is destroying communities, cutting down woodland, emitting a load of pollution, dividing communities, and so on. As long as it's economic activity, it doesn't matter if it's potholes in the road that mean you have to go and get your car fixed for the fifth time that year. It's economic activity, so it's all good. You know, farming, i.e. what produces food for us, is only 1% of GDP, so it's not seen as important. So there's something really unhelpful about that measure. And there are other measures out there. Uh, I'm not here to advocate for any one of them, but as an example, the uh, genuine progress indicator says, you know, let's think about what we want to be progressing. Okay, is the strength in the economy? And also, let's look at human progress indicators as well. How how well are we feeling? How well are our needs being tended to? And let's look at the environment and, and that, that sustains us, that we're part of, and how well is that being sustained or is it being eroded? And if you look at the genuine progress indicator, we've been in a recession for a long time. And so I think the point really is is to say, what's the purpose of the economy? And I think it should be to maximise well-being and minimise harm. And that's what Milton Friedman essentially argued that the free market economics would do. But he was essentially saying that it would maximize, it would minimize the concentration of power and therefore prevent harm from being done. So I, I think it's really good that I, I could share that vision with him, that, that that would be a great vision for an economic system. Unfortunately, it's very clear that this one isn't achieving that. It's doing quite the opposite. I think other people would argue that we have a very corrupted economic system i certainly agree with that that you could you can call it capitalism it's also very deeply corrupted and some would therefore not think it's a functioning version of capitalism so i I think there's something here about not getting hung up on definitions in a way that puts me in one camp and somebody else 
in another camp and we're having an ideological battle and says, come on, what do we all want? What do we all value in life? Surely it's to protect life and make sure there's something livable for future generations. Yeah, you're saying that, that it's the goal of the economic system, maximising well-being rather than maximising GDP. Yes, and, and actually it turns out that GDP and well-being decouple after a certain amount of income it happened a long time ago in the UK. Wanting to ensure that an economy develops is, is not like a bad thing, but it depends on the specific economic system. Our economic system, clearly to reduce and uh, go to uh, zero carbon emissions, net zero meaning, you know, obviously some of the carbon gets emitted, but some gets removed. And there are examples of how that could happen. You know, you've got the sort of degrowth economics that Jason Hickel's just got a new book about. You've got bioregional economics, you've got circular economics, you've got donut economics. And there's lots of great ideas out there of alternative approaches. And sometimes when you talk about changing the economic system, it's used as a way to attack people. It's like, oh, you know, you are anti-business or anti-market, whatever. And uh, they, businesses and markets exist outside of this current economic system. They would they, be perfectly um, able to exist within um, alternatives. Yeah, so it's not a question of sort of ideology or this or that. It's really, well, what you've said is, you know, maximising well-being as a sort of the direction to go and that that's what we should focus on rather than on the other example of GDP. So we're actually looking at where, at where we want to go rather than saying, oh, it's this ideology or that ideology. And let's agree what values we, we have. And well-being, you know, there are measures of well-being, but I, I mean it in its widest sense of everybody's well-being, including uh, that which sustains us. You know, clean water needs to be included. Um, if we haven't got clean water, we can't have uh, well-being. So how can this be fixed? What are the things that we can do that will help fix this? Well, I, I mean, there's two ways of answering that question. The, the, the one way is like what what policies need to be put in place? What what does the transition look like? And as I said, there's lots of great ideas out there about how how you go about making that change. Um, I just mentioned Jason Hill Degrowth book as an as, as an example, or you know Kate Raworth donut economics. You also need changes to the sort of legal framework. So the law of ecocide added as a fifth crime against peace uh, to the Rome Statute, that kind of thing. I think because we're in an age of crisis and they are only going to get worse, uh, even if we work really, really hard to, to, to turn to, to change course, we are going to face many crises. So we need to have a, a an agenda where we adapt the crises that are coming we're prepared for them and i mean i've said talked about the collapse of civilization if you're homeless that's already happened you know this country is not taking care of so many people if you're a, a key worker and that you know the covid crisis comes you don't get to be at home trying to keep yourself safe you know so many people have died who've been on that front line it's not fair and how do we therefore make sure that society is adapted to the changes that are coming I mean, I think another great idea is universal basic services. I mean, what I do need to say is, like, none of these are things that Extinction Rebellion and, and Money Rebellion as part of that are pushing for in terms of policies, because that's not our job. We don't say, oh, we, you know, it must be this one, or it must be that one. What we say is we want citizens' assemblies that are legally binding that have the ability to make these decisions based on being taught critical thinking skills and good facilitation and expertise coming in with a variety of viewpoints. So our, our solution, if you like, is not any one of these particular solutions. I just want to say, look, we, we don't have to think of anything. It's already been thought of, you know, what we need is the critical will. So the Citizens' Assembly would look at all these different possibilities and, and, and make decisions on our behalf and they're demographically representative of the people. They're not uh, affected by the vested interest that our current democratic systems captured to. So then the other interesting question, a, a different way of ask, answering your question, is how do we achieve this? Well, we can sit and talk till the cows come home, as we say, about wouldn't it be nice if we had universal basic services and donor economics and the law of ecocide or whatever else. It's not happening. We're going in the opposite direction because we live in a system that's resistant to change. So how do we support change to happen? And that's where mass civil disobedience comes in. 
what's happening is that basically nothing is happening. We're just carrying on, and we need to rethink these things. We need the political will. The political will is not there. So how are we going to achieve these? And so one of the tactics is mass civil disobedience. So tell us more about what will yeah. be involved there. I, I mean, it's, civil disobedience, and talking about peaceful, non-violent civil disobedience, done with love and done with service and done with sacrifice, you know, it, it comes with consequences for those of us that can manage it. Not everybody has to break the law, by the way, or potentially break the law. You can support civil disobedience in a way that works for you. So in Extinction Rebellion, for every person that's arrested, there's 10 people behind the scenes who are supporting fundraising or the legal support team or well-being or social media, etc. So there's lots of roles you can play that if, if, if arrest isn't something that's right for you. And each person needs to figure that out for themselves and their circumstances. Civil disobedience is, is something that's often celebrated historically. You know, we, we, we celebrate the toll puddle martyrs and how their sacrifice brought about the ability to have trade unions or the Kinder Scout mass, mass trespass, which means that uh, we have the right to roam in the countryside and we enjoy that freedom on a near daily basis, many of us, or that both men and women have the, the right to vote because of the actions of the Chartists and suffragettes, both of which involve breaking windows. So civil disobedience is a noble tradition that we know about. When it's in the current, it can upset people because it's by nature disruptive and that's sometimes disturbing and people speak as if they wish, well, maybe education would work or why don't you vote? And, and I would say, yeah, sure, all of those things, and by the way, they've been tried and they don't seem to be effective on their own. So Extinction Rebellion was launched in 2018 and by the winter of 2019 we were named as the number one influencer on the on the planet around the climate and ecological crisis. And I, I, I do think it was a zeitgeist moment, by the way. I think we had a lot of good luck and also down to Greta's work with uh, Fighters for a Future and David Attenborough's films and the IPCC reports and Jen Bendel's work on these adaptation. And we stand on the shoulders of, of many other social movements that have gone before us, but it does show you, and you can literally see it in the YouGov poll graph, that you take action and interest in the climate and ecological emergency goes up. And I think what's probably important to say to people is it's not the same as being right. You know, people often say, well, we agree with what they're saying, but we don't like how they're doing it. So XR, it's another way we call it, extinction rebellion needs to build up sufficient numbers of people to be involved it's around three percent according to one set of research uh, from chenoweth and stefan active participants in our social movement and then 50 percent of the population roughly needs to care about the issue what that's telling us is that it's okay if extinction rebellion is not right and actually a more modern example of civil disobedience that was very effective is act up the aids coalition to unleash power who did made vast strides in gay rights and um, getting a, hel a healthier and proper focus on research into AIDS. And they were very disruptive. And again, you know, what they do, what, the, the, the phrase is you, you stretch the over to window, you stretch the space of public discourse. So that's the, that's the sort of methodology. And there's a lot of, uh, science, there's a lot of social science literature on, on civil disobedience. It's um, important to, to hold a vision certainly proved effective in, in um it's no good just going Thank on the demonstrations you. you know marching up and down you have to do you have to do more than that in order to make change happen i think there's plenty of evidence that that's the case what would be the sort of definition of success of extinction rebellions money rebellion if you say right that's it we've uh, we, we've achieved what we want i mean or, or maybe put that another way you know what are your demands so somebody says well what do you want to what is it you want done so yes, so Extinction Rebellion have done lots of things to highlight the emergency and part of our strategy this year is to talk about the systemic issues that get in the way of that emergency being dealt with and the economic system, as we've discussed, is crucial to that. And so the first goal we have is to centre that conversation in the discussions about the climate and ecological crisis. So I was very pleased to see that Sir David Attenborough's recent film, Extinction of the Facts, did at least speak briefly about the economic system and its weddedness to the idea of infinite growth on a finite planet. So that 
Overton Wind is just starting to move in that direction. But generally, there is an attempt to set us up to say, oh, you either want a strong economy or you want environmentalism. No, the, the, in the, the, the economy has to be built on a functioning environment. It is not separate. You can't just have environmental economics as a separate discipline that's kind of the backwater down the academic, academic corridors. It needs to be central. Um, and so that's the first goal is to bring that fully into the discourse and make clear that the economy can protect people, but this is not about attacking people's jobs and so on. All the sort of tropes, really, that are used against environmentalism. And so any way in which we can open up the space for that conversation, we would welcome. The, the, the biggest goal is to enable, as I mentioned, citizens' assemblies at all levels, including the global citizens' assembly. The phrase I would use is to rewire humanity, is to look at the different layers of the economic system and say what needs to change, and for that to come from people from across the world. Uh, and we do have a, an independent team of people who are working to build the capacity for that global citizens' assembly, and there is interest at sort of UN level with that kind of thing happening. So it, this is all possible, but we need institutions and governments to point and say, yes, we need this to happen. Yes, it's time that humanity looks itself square in the face and asked itself these deepest questions. Because some of the international trade agreements, I mean, looking at, as I said, the international legal environment, and also these questions about competition, about the tax system globally, which is completely broken and extractive from majority world countries to the minority world. So on all this needs to be on the table because it all means that it's all in the way of of, of us solving this crisis. And so what we're saying in Money Rebellion is let's undertake acts of financially related civil disobedience. And there may also be actions at banks. That's already happened. Uh, Barclays Bank has been targeted by Animal Rebellion, which is a sister organisation. They fund much industrial animal agriculture, which is one of the most crucial industries that needs to uh, be stopped in terms of the destruction of the planet. So as well as targeting individual institutions, and there may be specific demands to do with that institution, it's it's also very important to speak to the systemic. And the systemic can only, in my view, be addressed by a citizens' assembly. And what I mean by that is that we just had the FinSec expose yet again. We find out, Kel Supreme, that the banks are up to all sorts. And they trot out the same old nonsense about, oh, you know, that's in the past. We're now following all regulations. It's literally nonsense. It's just it's like a sort of Wild West corruption corral that the, the, the bank is just... They're incentivized to, to behave badly. It's baked into the system. And so we have to look at systemic change. So if the um, Prime Minister, whoever he or she might be, calls you in, Gail, and says, you know, Gail, you know a lot about these things. You've got some very good ideas. Um, I know we need to do something about this. What would be the three things that you would tell him or her? I, I realise one of them would be citizens' assemblies, but what sort of a specific Absolutely. thing would, would you say? That you know, the, the first three things would be several things, but these would be my personal opinion, just that I'm speaking personally now. So, so yes, citizens' assemblies are our first point, and it would be that you look at the economic and legal frameworks within that. For myself, I think that we need to work with farmers across the UK to make sure that our food system is able to feed us and that, that we can transition to regenerative and veganic solutions to farming that capture carbon so we can work with nature and the land that we have. I think the other thing is they have to stop doing really stupid things like HF2, which is smashing through 100 ancient woodlands plus in, in the UK and there's an aviation shuttle service and they're expanding the roads with a 27 and a half billion program. And there's some some stupid things that can simply stop. And then that money can be reinvested in things that actually make sense. I, I think that we have to, to um, look, look at something like universal basic services. Uh, Anna Coote and others at the New Economics Foundation have costed that up as a, as a possibility. I think unless we have that in place, it's really hard to make uh, the transition. But there's so many other things like we are we are at the heart of um, 
the corrupt financial system. The, the, the UK is the leading corruption provider of corruption services in the world through our network of tax havens. And um, we, we so often get in the way of, of, leg- of international legislation. This is where you can get quite nerdy, actually. I mean, and this is where it's good to have the sort of expert come in and explain things. But my understanding is governments can create money. The modern monetary theory can create it uh, not as a debt that has to have interest paid on it. And obviously you have to limit it to do with inflation. You have to take that into consideration. The tax system then can serve a purpose to remove excessive money from the system that's accumulating because... One of the key issues is inequality. It's probably the key issue in, in, in the ecological crisis. So the other crises that other people who are listening to this may be more focused on, like, you know, what's happening, you know, taxpayers against poverty, what's happening to uh, people who, who are absolutely on the line trying to survive in, in, in this society. The, the, the depth of inequality is, is, is tragic. And we know from the spirit level analysis of one picket that, it affects everybody in society when you have a deeply unequal society. And also from an environmental point of view, the uh, 50% of emissions comes from 10% of the population. And then the, the, the wealthier you get, the, the, the carbon footprint is vast. It's, it's thickening. So one of the first things, again, that can be done simply is to put measures in place. I mean, one possibility is a carbon tax that would then be used as a dividend or would be used to pay for universal basic services, whatever. Um, that, that's one one way of going about things. Again, I'm not arguing for a particular thing. There'll be a debate about all of these things. But the point of that is, is in part, is to redistribute wealth because so much of the inequality creates the emission through excessive amounts of consumption. And I think it's something like, Sorry, if the richest people in the world reduce their consumption levels to that of the average European, so we're not talking about hair shirt living in a cave greenness and whatever people want to lump on us. Average European, carbon emissions would go down by a third. That's according to um, Professor Kevin Anderson at Tyndall Centre in Manchester on climate impact. So it just gives you a, a sense of how that inequality is distorting. It also is distorting society, distorting the environment. And it's also makes a bill and it tracks it tracks it with obesity, it tracks with low trust levels in society. It's a it's a fundamental issue that needs to be tackled. Finally, so what can people do? They think, right, I'm I'm up for this, I understand what money re- rebellion are trying to, to achieve. So what can they do about it? Yes, yeah, if, they, if, if they go on um, YouTube and uh, put Gail Bradbrook and Money with Ellie in, and they'll get the longer talk. You might not want to listen to it all, but right at the end of that, there's some um, uh, contacts. And in, in, in the bottom, there's a link to go through with a form, and you can say you're interested. And I give more examples in that talk about how we can undertake acts as financial civil disobedience. So here's some examples. One would be that we're going to work out what percentage of our tax is funding destruction in the same way the peace tax movement said some of the taxes are being used to pay for war and I'm not okay with that or weapons. And we, what we want to do with Money Rebellion is say, we are going to use our money for where it's needed. We're going to remove it from doing harm and put it where it's needed. Another example is that some of us are taking out credit cards with high street banks and we're making donations on behalf of those banks to the people most damaged by the investments those banks are making. So, for example, Survival International, who uh, support the front line of Indigenous people resisting the destruction of their homelands uh, and the banks that are funding that. So a donation on their behalf, and then we'll be asking them to write off that debt, and then we, we could match it. And so what we're trying to do is demonstrate how our money can be used in a positive way. We'll also be asking people if they would be willing to not pay their mortgage if, let's say, 10,000 people from the same bank joined them. So strength in numbers. Uh, so obviously, you know, if you just did that on your own, that would put you at, at, at some risk. And we do, by the way, have legal and financial information for people to share. And we wouldn't encourage anybody to do anything without um, or we don't encourage people. That makes it sound like you're giving them along, really. We wouldn't, 
we wouldn't share information about what people can do without also sharing information. So with that one, there's the strength in numbers that we can build. And people can also support Money Rebellion by helping us organise it. So one of the jobs is to um, participate in what's called rebel ringing. And you get on the phone and you phone people up and you ask them what they need to know. And you also ask them, are you a small business owner? Would you withhold £5 if other business owners joined you in this kind of thing? And in that way, we will build up this threat of civil disobedience as well as some leading actions and we'll hopefully open the space to have this most urgent conversation about our political economy and why it needs to be changed. And let's hope we can get some action. You know, it really is needed and it's very urgent. Yeah, we are many and they are few as they say, so it's, we need to get together and uh, get organised. So thank you. Thanks, Gail, very much for your time to explain to us how Extinction Rebellion's Money Rebellion is all about. And I wish you success in bringing change. I now have a much better understanding of your plans and I hope those listening to this programme do too. You can find out more at extinctionrebellion.uk and then there's a, sec- a, a link that goes to Money Rebellion. Now there's been widespread frustration at the failure of partisan politics and traditional economics to end this toxic toxic inequality worldwide and to act on urgent issues my initial concern regarding money rebellion was that there were no specific demands to resolve economic justice well other organizations are particularly good at that there are many reports and proposals such as those on wealth tax from tax justice uk demos and the uk wealth tax commission plus the comprehensive 2018 report entitled prosperity and justice from the institute of public policy research and many more but so many of these brilliant proposals fail to get traction and progress into policy politicians can be too scared to act on issues they consider complicated or may get disapproval from the rich and powerful which not surprisingly can also be funders or they be their funders so the vested interests can win however Civil disobedience disrupts everyday life and gets noticed. It's the reality. XR is really no different from the suffragettes who eventually won through. Now, indeed, Taxpayers Against Poverty, the organisation I referred to earlier, does in fact propose fresh, simple and highly practical answers that will provide immediate and substantial relief to millions of people struggling to make ends meet. And this lack of action really does call for determined efforts to change the political will for the benefit of all. What do you think? Contact us at info at realagendaradio.org or via our website, realagenda.org. We'd love to hear your views and we can hope that we can help inform, involve and inspire you into action. What's coming up next on The Real Agenda? Well, we've got more episodes of Inequality Bites, which is produced by the Equality Trust, and also the Compassion in Politics podcast plus we will also be featuring again gavin esler in our series the state we're in with gavin esler now a special thanks to our sponsors the reverse media group one of the fastest growing search of media companies find out why at reversemediagroup.com now one thing is certain people want to see change to a more compassionate and just society as well as more courageous politicians prepared to do the right thing for people over party it's just not happening But it can, and it's urgent, and it's up to us to make it happen. That's The Real Agenda. I'm Tom Burgess. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.